now. Live, let's check. Okay, so we're live, and now I just have to share the screen. Yeah, no, I'm already sharing, so it should be good. All right, I'm up in the private window, it's looking like a black screen. So, um, let's check. <laughs> Did you in OBS? Um, no, I'm already sharing, so it should be good. <laughs> Sam, turn off the sound from YouTube. <laughs> okay. Um, did you in OBS select the Zoom browser? Yep. In OBS, can you see us and the presentation? It's still a black screen in OBS, but let me see if I can re... So under media source, I should be able to select the Zoom browser. Mm -hmm. It should be like Zoom meeting, something, something. That's going to be under media source. You're okay. Scene collection tools view. Okay, so where would I find that? The source. Okay. So if you hang on, I'm gonna reshare my screen. If you have OBS. It yeah. should be right here under sources. And yeah. so if you go to add, go to window capture, and then you could say, you could name it if you want. Um, and then here you select uh, Zoom. So add, window capture, Zoom. There we go, and zoom in. All right, so we're live. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we have a really great presentation for you today. Uh, today we have Martha McGee and Leah Gatos, and they will be presenting on Budgeting and Funding 101 here at DePaul University for your short film. I'm just gonna exit out, and if there's any questions, I'll let you guys know. Take it away. Awesome, thanks Sam. Sorry everyone for our technical difficulties. Um, Sam, if you wanna check OBS real quick, I'm looking at the live and there's only like a fourth of us showing. The OBS. You might just have to resize like the window. How's that? Any better? Getting there. Almost. There you go. Perfect. Sorry about that, guys. Perfect. All right. Hello, everyone. So I'm Leah Gatos. I'm a senior um, in the BFA uh, film and TV program with a concentration in producing and a business minor. And my lovely co host is Miss Martha McGee. Uh, Martha, do you want to share a little sentence by yourself? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm an adjunct uh, professor that works at DePaul. Um, I teach primarily uh, foundations of television, pre-production, television uh, production. Um, and yeah, I'm delighted to be here talking about the very, very important uh, subject of budget and funding. Yes. So just to kind of jump right into it, um and but feel free to interject whenever you want to but so kind of thinking from my experience as a producer how i would just move forward with budgeting right off the bat is doing what i would call an intake meeting um and so this intake meeting should happen with usually 
the writer, director, financer. Um, in film school, they tend to all be the same person, but I have worked on shoots where the director is a different person than the financer, who's a different person than the writer. Sometimes the financer is the lead actor. Um, really, you want to do this intake meeting with the director and whoever has the money, because those are the questions that you need answered. So um, kind of questions that you want to ask about, uh, I would like to ask, just what the story is about, because that gets the director talking. Um, and you find out a lot of little details that you probably didn't know before. And so you kind of find out what kind of story they're trying to tell. And it lets you know, are they trying to do a car chase? Are they trying to film in a hospital? Like, are they trying to do anything crazy? Or is this like a living room drama? kind of style. You should probably read the script before this meeting, but even after reading the script, kind of just asking a general story question lets you know where their head is at as to what they intend on doing. Um, and then I always follow up with, is the script locked? Because that'll tell you when you can start planning things, when you can start scheduling things, and that'll just shift your dates around. So then I kind of move into the big financing question of, do we actually have money? Where do you intend to get money? What's the plan? And that, you know, there's no wrong answer to this, but it, you need to know upfront, do you have, you know, 500, a thousand, $1,500 from your dad, a grant you got, whatever, or is that something we need to go find? And then next ask about dates. And a lot of directors come into meetings with dates. They usually have to be moved. So I always ask, do you have dates in mind? Um, and a lot of the times this is for a thesis or a project or a certain festival people want to get into. So knowing specific dates and deadlines that you need to meet will help you do this. Um, and along with dates, the big question of the day is always, how many days do you think this will take to shoot? Sometimes it's going to take more than they think. Sometimes it's going to take less, but that number is going to affect almost every financial decision you make because um, it's going to determine how many days you're at a certain location, how many meals you have to feed people, how many days you have to pay actors for. So like that number is super important. Um, and then next would be crew, specifically the size of your crew. Are we talking five people, 10 people, 15 um, the biggest student film I've been on had 100 people, and that was a lot. Um, and along with crew, are there any special crew members, specifically ones that we're paying? Do you want a steady cam? Because that's going to need an operator. Is there a stunt coordinator? Um, those kinds of things. Crew members that aren't going to be students. And then for cash, the big question is, are they SAG or minors? Because SAG will immediately, you know, flat rate, um, there's a SAG minimum that you have to pay. And then it's really helpful to know if there are minors on set just because you have to hit specific day hours with them. And in terms of budgeting, you also know that if there's a minor, there's at least going to be one other person on set, usually their parents, sometimes a teacher, it depends. But when you're counting for a minor, you actually have to count for two people to feed and transport and travel and all of that. In terms of equipment for student films, I will always push to just use DePaul's equipment. Um, I've worked with quite a few cinematographers who always want to rent a camera or stabilization or whatever. I feel like unless this is your big senior project or your thesis film, there is no reason to rent outside of DePaul. Um, save your money, use it on something bigger, just use the free stuff for right now. As far as locations, um, along with just use the free stuff, utilize CineSpace as much as you can. I know we can't get in there right now, but in a typical year, you can build whatever you want on the empty stages at CineSpace. You can paint a wall. Um, if you get special permission, you can bring in furniture, you can move stuff around. Like You can pretty much do whatever you want on those stages as long as you ask for permission and it's approved. Um, in terms of art, Really, I always ask, like, what's the big, what's the big showstopper in art? Um, so I produced this film that I'll talk about later called Gaby, and we had this big, like, clown birthday party. It was a circus-themed birthday party, and so there was balloons and, like, fake noses and big bow ties and 
you know, the whole thing, but there was this giant clown cutout that had to be like the centerpiece of the scene. I knew it was going to be big. I knew it was going to be expensive. And so just already thinking about like, art has to figure out how to transport this thing. We need to find the funds to make it and someone to like make the thing. Uh, in post for student films, I'll always push have all of your post team also be students. Um, there are plenty of editors, colorists, sound designers, VFX artists who are in school, who are at the same level as you. There's no reason you have to go out and find someone to pay. Um, kind of caveat to that, like I understand in thesis films, sometimes people want to do something a little out of a student's wheelhouse, especially for like VFX or color correction. There are circumstances, but I'd say for the most part, just stick to students, um, it'll keep the budget down. And overall, like, we're all students, we should just be working together. Um, and then I always like to add festivals and distribution in this intake meeting, kind of just to get almost like, take the director's temperature of like, where do you intend for this to end up? Is this just going to sit on your YouTube? Is this literally going to sit on your hard drive for years? Do you want to get into Sundance? Like, or do you want to self distribute it on Amazon direct? Like what's the plan here? Um, and should we start setting aside money for that? So I have an example um, of just some minutes that I've taken during one of these meetings. So I take minutes at every meeting. Um, I love Keely Wise. She teaches entertainment law and I'm planning on going to law school for entertainment law. She has taught me that one of the most important things to do is take minutes at every single meeting you go to, because if someone says something or someone comes up with an idea, you want to be able to be like, yeah, I was a part of that, or that was my idea. You just want to have things in writing, but it makes it helpful now because now I have all of these meeting minutes from meetings past. So here's just um, some minutes from an intake meeting that I had with a director so we talked about the story and he just gave me a log line for it. And then the script wasn't um, locked. We still needed a shooting draft. Finances were a bit of a mess here because he already had some money, but he wanted to raise more money and wasn't super sure where he was going to get it. Um, I kind of wanted to inform him that a lot of the money was going to be spent on cast because he wanted SAG actors. He wanted a big crew. So there was going to be a lot of money spent on catering. For the cast, there needed to be a child actor. Um, this was also for a class, so he needed a casting director. And this, there was this interesting thing where because it was for a class, he needed the actors to go to his class for him to like rehearse a scene in front of his professor. So that was just something interesting that I had to make sure when we were casting that there were people who were willing to do that. Um, he wanted a decent sized crew. We kind of spitballed some department heads. This is the dates. And then because it was for a class, there was a lot of specific deadlines that we needed to hit. So I made sure to note all of those. And then for distribution, I kind of just asked him for his dream festival list of like what he was intending on. And so I noted all of those down. And then we kind of talked about distribution beyond that of maybe pairing all of his shorts that he's done for film school together and releasing it on Amazon or something. I'm, I just want to say, I'm so happy that you put such emphasis on distribution yeah. right at the intake yeah. meeting, uh, just so you have a goal um, of when things need to be done by, um, so you can submit, so you can raise funds to submit them and also it to travel money. Just yeah. have this in mind and also just a certain you want it to look a certain way to get into those festivals. Exactly. Yeah. And I feel like there's such this film school thing of just getting stuck in post, dying on a hard drive, never going anywhere. And it's like, if you're spending all of this time, money and effort on these things, let people see them, yeah. try and make some money off of it, get some name recognition, like do something with it. Don't just let it sit there. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm. Oh struggling real quick. Okay. So Martha and I were kind of brainstorming exactly 
how to explain to budget. And we both just kind of decided that the easiest way to do this would just be to build a budget live. Um, so I have this fake story that I made up just to kind of give us some, you know, specs on what are we budgeting for. So our movie is called Quality Time. Um, Emily and Darren just moved in together when a global pandemic strikes. Quality time just got a little more intense. So this is a two-day shoot, 20-person crew, but there is a fight scene, so we do need a stunt coordinator. Um, Two-person cast, and the director asked for them both to be SAG. One location, and the director wants a full festival and distribution budget. So those are our fake specifications. And so if we go into here... We now have our fake budget. So I'm going to kind of be going back and forth between our PowerPoint slide and our fake budget. But this is the template that I tend to use. I think my mentor passed it down to me and I passed it down to my mentees. So this is just kind of like the DePaul budget that I've seen floating around. Um, but it's broken down into these pretty easy to understand categories. So name of the thing you're spending money on, the contact, usually the person who will be spending the money, um, the estimated day rate, so, you know, $100 a day per food, and then the amount of days needed. And so you can kind of mess around with this category. Sometimes I use it as actual number of days needed. Sometimes it's just how many things we need. Um, and then the total cost, and it's all broken down into categories and then there's totals at the bottom and at the top for easy understanding. So just to kind of get into it, so expendables are our first thing. It's also kind of petty cash. So I break it down into these three categories, um, big budget, medium budget, and bare bones. And these are all student specific. So if a director comes to me and they're like, I have $5,000, I'm like, okay, all of the expendables are going to be $100. Um, if a director comes to me and they're like, I have $2,000, and it's like, okay, all of the expendables are going to be $50. If they're like, I have, you know, $600 in a cheese stick, I'm like, okay, we'll maybe have $25 per department, probably zero. So if we go into here, we can just start putting in our expendables. And then just move down the departments. So Expendables kind of covers whatever the department head wants it to cover. For camera, this is things like gaff tape, you know, <laughs> funny that I can't think of anything else than gaff tape, but paper tape for marks, um, bongo ties, clothes pins, gels. I've seen... Um, Sound guys get hand warmers because it's cold and they know that all of their equipment is going to be outside. Um, batteries for mics. It's kind of whatever you need it to be just to have the money budgeted. I always say budget and underspend. So just always like always over budget because you'd rather come out under than over. So after our expendables, we kind of move into catering. And so there are three formulas that, again, like my mentor taught me and I've just kind of adopted. So the meal equation is the number of crew members times $10. And that's your meal budget per day. So then you do need to multiply that by how many days you're shooting. For craft services, you just take that number that you just found for your meal and divide it by two, which you get your craft services budget. And then... I've created this extra meals category, which I'll go back into when we go into the budget, which is craft services divided by two. So if we go back. So like I said, we have a crew of, we'll say 20 people because the director told us 15 to 20. So we do 20 times 10. And we have $200 a day to spend on meals. So then we need to multiply that by two for two days of shooting. So for two days of shooting for 20 people, we're expecting to spend $400. Then there's this thing that everyone should have, but sometimes we don't have it in the budget called a second meal contingency. And so that is when 
really you go over time. So if you're expecting to shoot for a 12 hour day, feeding people at the six hour mark in between, but you end up going 13, 14, 15 hours, you want to have money set aside so you can order pizza, sandwiches, quick meal down the street so that everyone will keep working for you and will actually stay to finish the shoot and not just leave. So I always set aside just one day's worth of food. And then going back to that equation that we just talked about, the craft services budget is just our meal budget divided by two. And craft services is, you know, anything and everything from breakfast to snacks, coffee, whatever keeps people going throughout the day. And then this is the category that I've kind of created, which is extra meals. So this is when you have people at camera test, fittings, prep day, wrap day. You need people to go in two hours before set to pick up the grip truck. It's just all of those little extra things that people really don't want to do. But if you tell them you'll buy them lunch, they'll probably do it. So I've kind of come up with the equation. Just take your crafty budget, divide it by two, and you're good to go. So then that brings our total food food budget to $900. So for casting, go back to our PowerPoint for a minute. Student films are considered ultra low budget by the SAG office, which allows us to have a SAG minimum of $125 a day. Usually when I'm budgeting any casting, um, I will just automatically put in $125 a day as the highest we're willing to go and then subtract from there based on what the director or financer can afford. Um, one trick that I learned, I don't remember who taught this to me, but if you can't afford day rates for actors, try flat rates. So I produced a movie with James Choi two summers ago. Um, it was a feature length film and we couldn't afford to pay the actors 125 a day. So we gave them I think like $500 for the whole movie. It was like 18 days of shooting for $500. And so it allows you to pay your actors a larger sum of money than they probably get without going overboard. So we, actually have, a question. we have two SAG actors here. So we'll put in our 125 a day for two days. We have a question actually, if you guys are willing to get that right now. Yeah. So let me pull it up. So the question is, uh, do you believe that student films uh, should go through a casting agency? If so, do you have any recommendations? And if not, what alternatives do you believe are the best? Yeah. So in a couple of weeks, Maddie Dodge and I are going to be talking about casting and crewing. So we'll get more into that. Um, I've never gone through a casting agency. Martha, you can share if you have, but I use backstage. Um, that's the only thing I've ever used. DePaul has a discount code. Um, it's DePaul Film in all caps, and that'll make every listing you put on Backstage free. So you can use basically their, their like premium services for free. Um, and that code also never expires. Like little tip, if you graduate, the code doesn't expire. Um, but yeah, so I've never used a casting service. I always just go on Backstage or have friends at the theater school and they'll just come on and do it. Yeah, I'd say everything that I've worked on at DePaul, that, is, that has been what, what has happened. Um, most of my experience outside, though, has been, yeah, for big studios and, and, and stuff like that. So, yes, that was something the norm. But, but everything here, it's, been, it's worked out really, really well through, through backstage or just through the theater school. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's necessary. Awesome, thank you. And we will put the uh, backstage password in the comments section for anyone who wants to use that. Cool. Yeah, it's funny because that's treated like a secret, but it's not a secret. Like, DePaul has a code, but yeah, people don't know about it. I Yeah, it works well. <laughs> it does, yeah. The first casting call I ever posted, I did pay the $25, and then someone told me that we had a code, and I was very upset about it. But <laughs> cool. Um, so yeah, so transportation is something that I feel like gets forgotten about on a lot of student sets, transportation both of yourself, um, your equipment, and your cast. So 
I always start with parking because it's like, let's, you know, ignore for a second how we're going to get there. When we get there, where are we going to go? And so is it an apartment? Is it a house in the suburbs? Is there street parking? Can we park in the driveway? Is it a restaurant? Do they have a parking lot? Um, always trying to find the best free option to park near your location. Um, if not, the city of Chicago has an amazing film office. And so you just go, go on their film office. They have student discounts for everything that you need on there. And so literally any kind of permit that you would need, it's $25. Um, if for whatever reason you don't have the money or don't, you know, can't put in the time and effort, that's totally fine. I would say get parking permits for, uh, if you have the grip truck, the grip truck, if you have a, an equipment or art truck for that and one car, um, usually I like if the first AD or if a PA keeps their car close to set, just in case someone has to go somewhere, you got to pick up lunch, you have to, you know, go to the grocery store, where, whatever you to do, there's like a car right outside the house or right outside the restaurant. So I always try and get two parking permits for every set that I'm on, regardless of where we are. I shot, uh, I produced a film that shot on Hubbard Street uh, on a Friday night while all of the bars and nightclubs are open. And because we had those two parking spots, like it saved us. Um, so make sure you know where you're going once you get there. And then I always try and convince my director to either do a gas reimbursement or have a small fund set aside for any parking tickets that people might get or like parking garage fees that people might have to pay. Um, it's just one of those like kind courtesy things because we're all students. We're not paying each other. So like feed people and pay for their transportation to get to your set is kind of the common courtesy. And then moving back to, okay, you know, now we know we're going to park there. Now we know we're going to pay for people to park there. How do we get there? Usually carpool tends to work out, especially when you're working with enough upperclassmen. Um, everyone either has a car, has access to a car, or has a friend who has a car or whatever. Um, so carpooling tends to work out. But the biggest thing that I feel like students always forget is how am I going to transport the equipment and art specifically? Um, cause if you have the grip truck, you can kind of get away with putting camera stuff on there sometimes. Um, but so how are we going to, you know, how are we going to transport that gi giant clown sign? And so I tend to always budget in a U-Haul, even if the director tells me we won't need it. Um, they are pretty cheap, but they can get very expensive, especially if you need them for more than a couple days. So I always put in a U-Haul. This is... 15 foot truck, I think it's $30 a day. That's usually what I budget for. Um, and so just adding in that, and then they do have a mileage fee. So for the 15 foot truck, it's $1.49. And then, like I said, I kind of use this category of my multiplier. So right now it's not going to be a day rate for me. It's going to be miles. So I'm going to budget a hundred miles for the whole trip. Sometimes you go under, sometimes you go over, but it's nice to know you'll probably spend about $150 on miles um and that's also where you you know can put your gas budget in for the truck because you do have to pay for gas for the grip truck and a u-haul if you rent one and then for parking i always just put in 50 dollars a day um you usually will never need that much unless you have like 20 cars and then external parking is my like parking ticket parking garage allowance that I give myself and then for locations so there's <laughs> locations are one of those things that you're going to set a budget for it and that's not going to be even close to what you need um, sometimes you're going to have to go so much over or it's going to be so much under or free that it's laughable um, but so I always just kind of try and talk to my director about the locations and just get a gauge for what they're thinking, whether it's um, a house, an apartment, you know, what kind of budget are we looking at? And specific questions that I ask are, you know, are you looking for the same interior that matches the exterior? Like if we're shooting in one house, is it going to be the same house for the inside or the outside? Or 
do you want a very specific outside that we're definitely not going to be able to find it to the same house? And so kind of just trying to think in your head, like, okay, this is a one location film, but you want, you know, a, a pool in the backyard. And I know that it's going to be so much easier to get the interior that you want in one location and then just find a backyard with a pool in it. But that means it's two locations, which means our locations budget is going to go up. Um, and then just kind of thinking about locations and days for locations, I always try and check in with the director or if there is a production designer at that time about pre-dress, um, especially in these shoots where it's one location for the entire thing. A lot of the times the production designer will want to come in a day early, dress everything, and then they can just do touch-ups the day of. And so that's important for budgeting because your two day shoot actually is turning into a three day shoot for art. So you need to pay for three days of a location instead of just two. So for this, I always just kind of put a general locations budget. So like I'll put a thousand dollars right now, um, which probably is not going to be even close to what the director is going to want to do, but just to give them an idea of like, you know, if you want a mansion in the suburbs, we're probably going to spend a thousand dollars in like three days. And then moving on to art. So art and locations in my head kind of live in the same world of like, you just kind of need to give an estimation and then take it to your production designer and they'll actually give you a budget breakdown for it. Um, so again, just kind of talk to your director about like, what are you thinking art wise for our fake movie here? The costumes and set deck is pretty simple. However, Emily runs an art studio. So the props and like her fake art setup are going to be a little on the pricier side. Um, and this is also where I tend to ask what's the biggest prop or set piece that we'll be traveling with. And so for example, like, you know, Emily's an artist. So the biggest thing that we're going to have to transport is an easel. Um, and just kind of knowing that like, okay, so I'm definitely going to need a truck or a van for that. Easels are kind of expensive. So that's like at least $150 towards our budget. And so just trying to start thinking about all of those things that art will be spending money on. And then similar to locations, I was kind of like to start at a thousand dollars. It really depends on the shoot some directors are super down for a thousand dollars some are like i will not spend over 150 so i always overestimate and then kind of make them bring me down then be like yeah we can do this for 150 dollars and then the production designer is very mad at me so let me see if there's anything else oh i want to talk about contingency so this is a like real world thing um my mentor taught it to me, but I don't know if it's super well known, um, kind of outside of my bubble, but contingency is this really important thing because it helps us to not go over budget. And so basically what contingency is, is it's your safety net. It's your, if I go over budget, I have this little nest egg that I can dip into and that helps, um, God, all of the stories that I've had going into contingency are because of the grip truck. Um, the grip truck is known for breaking down. It's known for needing to be towed. Your contingency will probably be used for the grip truck. I've had it happen to be three times and it's always for someone to come help. So <laughs> just knowing that, but uh, the contingency equation is just your total budget times 10% and just kind of have that set aside. I like a hidden secret. I rarely tell my directors about contingency. So like if I, if I were presenting to them a budget, I'd just be like, yeah, it's 5,500. I wouldn't say it's 5,000 because that contingency should just be like, everyone should just know we're going to spend 5,500. And then it's like a big surprise at the end of the day when you don't spend that much. So like I said, this director also wanted to include a big festival budget. Um, oh, that was the wrong button. Sorry. Um, this director also wanted to include a festival budget and they were talking about possible self-distribution. So <clears throat> when I'm talking to my directors, I kind of, what size festival run they intend to do? And that's really number of festivals. So it's like, do you intend to enter 2025 or do you intend to enter five to 10 local ones? Um, 
so for this example, I would kind of say like a medium sized festival run is like 10 ish festivals. Um, and the director's dream festival is nifty. So kind of just keeping in mind, like that's the level that we're shooting for. And after they do their festival run, they want possible self-distribution. So I always just like to throw in some money for Facebook ads, Instagram ads, managing those accounts, maybe putting up some posters around town, any licensing fees that you'll need to get to get all of the rights, the music, whatever. So for festivals, I will overestimate once again at 500 and same for, these are independent P&A costs. Um, and usually like every time that I've done a distribution budget for a director, they have always kind of ignored it. So I like to tell people, you know, if you do exactly what you told me you're going to do, it's probably going to be about a thousand dollars. And then they just pretend they won't spend that money and spend it anyway. But that's just my own personal gripe about distribution. <laughs> So I have these nice big boxes up here that help to very easily see what you're spending. So what I would do is take this completed budget and I would send it to the director. And because of these nice big bubbles over here, I'd be like, okay, so in production, based on what you told me you want to do, it's going to be $5,500 based on distribution of what you told me you want to do, it's gonna be $1,100. So in total, if we do everything exactly the way you said you wanted to do it, it's gonna be you know, a little over 6,500. And then they freak out and they panic. <laughs> so this is my, my fake review with the director. So like I said, I kind of go over everything and I'm like, based on what you told me you want, this is how much I think it's going to cost. And I kind of break it down for them and just be like, listen, this, this budget right here is everything you told me you wanted. And it's a fantastic time on set for your crew. They're going to be very well fed. They're going to have snacks. They're going to have their transportation paid for them. Actors are going to be paid. Everyone's going to be really, really happy. And then I kind of go through and I explain to them the things that we can cut, um, which I'll do in a minute, but I kind of explain like, okay, now that we've cut these 10 things, it's going to be an okay time on set. Like maybe there's not a gas budget anymore. Maybe actors are getting a flat rate instead of a day rate. You know, maybe there's good coffee, but not great coffee and like snap but not breakfast. And like, it's going to be, you're going to get the job done and it's going to be an okay time on set. And then if you take away kind of everything that you don't really need, you take away all of your expendables money, all of your snack money, your extra meals, you're not paying the actors anything, there's no gas reimbursement, there's no parking, like, you can shoot the movie, the movie's gonna happen, everyone's gonna have a terrible time on set, like, it's not gonna be fun, the art director's probably gonna be pretty strapped, location's probably gonna be, like, your parents' house, you can still do the movie, but this is, like, what the reality is gonna look like for you, um, and so I was trying to kind of explain to a director, I I'm not here to be the bad guy. I'm not here to tell you no. I'm just here to realistically explain to you what this money is going to get you. We have another question if you uh, want to field that now or wait until later. Yeah, I'm down with that. So, Martha, if you have anything to add, feel free to jump in too. Yeah, yeah, I will, but we'll do the question first and then I'm going to jump in. So cool. the question has to do with uh, funding on the, the back end of the project, more dealing with distribution. Uh, yeah. Do you fund... Uh, when you're financing, do you also include uh, a budget for travel to uh, out of out of state film festivals? If you do, how many people are you budgeting that for? Is it above the line, below the line? Just a general summary of whether or not you're funding for travel expenses. Yeah, so that's kind of why I inflate my festivals budget because a lot of people think it's just for festival and like uh, fees like festival submission fees, but it's also for you to go there. Um, so in my fake example where, you know, my director wanted to do 10 pretty local festivals except for Nifty, I'm thinking, okay, festival submission fees are probably $20, $25. 
Um, if you're going anywhere in the Midwest, you can drive there. So just kind of thinking like tank of gas, small hotel fee, your really big budget would be a flight to the West Coast. Um, and maybe if you're really strapped for cash, you can drive. And so I personally would only budget for yourself and one other person. So like yourself is in the director. Um, and then one person who you could, who you would bring with you. Um, I feel like that second person kind of depends on which festival you're going to, because sometimes your movie will be up for an acting award, so you want to bring the actor. Sometimes your movie will be up for a writing award, so you want to bring the writer. Sometimes it's just like a really big film market, so you should bring the producer. Um, it kind of depends on what you're going for. Awesome, thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that, and I'm, I'm so glad that you covered like the, the budget is not this equals this budget yeah it, it equals whatever level you're going for I mean you can do you know mission impossible for for twenty thousand dollars yeah <laughs> look, it's not gonna look like what you see in the in the theater but it can be done you won't get um cruise you won't get helicopters you won't get good shots you know it's gonna look a whole lot different but it can be done so just figuring out what's important uh, to the film, um, how much money, you know, where you want to go with it, uh, the things that are a must-have. If if it needs to look a certain way, it has to be this beautiful lighting shot a certain way. Maybe the money goes there. If it's uh, it has to be a an actor that people recognize, um, maybe you put more money there. So it really it's it's a very fluid thing. Um, I had a friend that was like, "Here's my script. Here you go, line producer. Give me give me the budget." And she was like, "How much do you want to spend?" Yeah. <laughs> and my friend's like, "I don't understand. Tell me how much it is." She's like, "No, it's 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 you. Like you have to give me like a level here yeah. because we can go right. You can do it super super cheap, but is that the film that you want to make? Like." figure out the film that you want to make, what it needs to look like, and absolutely try to save money any way you can to get there. But there is that line between efficient and cheap. So right. trying to, to find that, thread that needle. <laughs> so yeah. Well, and I've kind of, like you said, with your, your, your line producer friend, I've kind of found myself in that position where directors come to me and be like, can you produce this? How much is it going to be? And so I just kind of adopted this role of being like, this is the worst it's going to be. This is the most money you can spend. Um, but it is hard because we are at that student level. So there is, there are just some kind of understandings of like, okay, we're not paying crew. We're not renting anything. Um, but in the real world, it's like, like you said, if we're paying everybody and renting from a rental house and paying for travel and whatever, it's like, that's a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, and you want someone from Second City. Okay, that's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Like, there's you can go up very, very fast. Too, because Marlo wants to watch my class. Cool, Martha. Is there anything else you want to add? I, I feel like talking so much. Oh no! Well, you have a lot to cover. You have a lot to cover. I mean, yeah, no, I, I definitely want to address the sliding scale because that is that is a very good point to to shoot for, because it really could go could be anything. But to like have the different like. Yes, everyone is fed and everyone is, you, you have, gas money is lovely. Like, if you want people to continue to to show up, I mean, if you're paying people nothing, um, it is, like, they could just, like, right, if they come there and there's, like, no food and they're not getting, yeah. they're, they're spending a lot of money in, in, in gas and parking, they probably won't show up again, even if they're like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll be there tomorrow. And why? Right. Um, Why am I coming back? Yeah. Yeah. So food, it's like, I can't overemphasize how important food is. I mean, even, even if you get to like huge films, like it is as soon as you get into that, the, the, the studio, it's like, where's craft services? What do they have? Let's yeah. check it out. Where, where, like who's catering this? And it is like, that's all anyone talks about. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so, it's, it's, it's interesting so too because I uh so I day play sometimes on Chicago PD and I've become really good friends with some of the second second ADs and the second ADs 
it's this thing in the production department where if they have a really bad day on set planned, they will purposefully beef up the food budget. <laughs> like I, I was on this day on Chicago PD where it was an overnight, which already awful. It was yeah. really cold and it was an overnight. exterior. So it was like Not snowing bad. at bad. night, negative whatever degree in Chicago. And we had like, steak and lobster for dinner and everyone was so happy like there was crab there was like clams like everyone was having a great time for that like 45 minute period right it, it's it's such an important part of, of the morale and just like hey it's going to be long hours like the first thing you when you start a, a show like the the production coordinator is like okay what kind of food do you like? We'll, we'll uh -huh. make sure we stock everything. And I, you know, I was new. I was like, um, I don't know. Like, I like product 19 cereal and ding dong. <laughs> and from that moment on, always in there. And I'm like working in the middle of the night. And I'm like, well, you know, got my ding dongs. Like, it's everything's fine because they thought of me. They thought of making sure that I'm fed. I'm working really hard, but I'm still happy. And it, it was just a, a really big thing. <laughs> always yeah. is. So yeah, just making sure that people are happy to be there. Um, they'll they'll keep showing up, and I'm sure that you will use them again and again. And you want to keep them happy, and yeah. you'll get a reputation for taking care of people. Oh yeah, definitely. People, you get a reputation for what kind of food you bring on set. Yeah, you really do. <laughs> you really really do. Yeah. <laughs> we have a. Cool. So going back to our. Sam, did you say something? I did. We have another question coming in from Virgil. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you'll cover this later, but are you including budgeting for post-production, VFX, editing, supervisors, anything like that? So I kind of touched on that earlier. Um, I would say for student stuff, unless it's like something super advanced that you know a student couldn't do or a student couldn't go to a professor to figure out, um, I would try and keep the post budget at zero always. We have a post department, like we have people, um, you know, we have editors, we have graphic designers, we have people who do VFX and post sound design and color correction, like we have those people. So try and find those people, try and use the students that you have access to before you would go and make a post budget. That's kind of where, where I'm at. Um, unless you know, like, okay, for my thesis film, this house is going to explode. Like, you know, I would probably hire someone or immediately reach out to one of the VFX professors and be like, do you think this is something a student could accomplish? Or is this something you could help a student accomplish before you even like start budgeting for that? Um, and if your script has a house explosion in it, I would probably just rewrite it instead of trying to budget for VFX. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, I was actually gonna gonna ask myself. Like, I absolutely there. There's some great students are are very talented. So it's like keeping it in house and and getting them to to help out with that. But in terms of like, have you ever had uh, an issue with music um, mm -hmm. licensing or getting someone to write it, or how did you work that in? Yeah, this is something Keely taught me actually. Um, Keely Wise, excellent professor. Um, so for most things, for anything that you do just for school, um, you don't need the rights where you can just throw it in, show it in class, turn it into a professor, whatever. Um, if you are planning on putting it through festivals, they have festival licensing fees. So if you know you're only going for festivals and it's just going to sit on a hard drive after, you can pay like 25, 50, 100 bucks to whoever owns the music um just for festivals instead of like it kind of ends up being a couple hundred to a couple thousand dollars when you actually want it um it's like what is it called it's like in perpetuity basically forever um it's a lot of money yeah to do that and so keely taught us that they have festival licensing fees which are super super cheap and very bare minimum um beyond that i would say if you're planning on doing anything with it beyond festivals to start looking into covers, uh, original music and composers. Now that we have the theater, not the theater school, now that we have the music school, I have worked with so many amazing composers at the theater school. I have a couple who 
ironically enough, like I lived with freshman year in the dorms, like they were my neighbors and now they're at the music school and they compose like all of my short films. That's perfect. Yeah. And so I would say kind of once again, go back, go back to DePaul. We have a theater, like we have a music school. I keep saying theater school. We have a music school. There are people who are literally going to school to be composers. Yeah, while you're, here, while you're here, absolutely. You yeah. use everyone and make contacts because the people that write, like you're, you, you knew them freshman year and now you're, you're working with them. I mean, that's going to be the same when everyone graduates. The people that you're working with, you will continue to work and see and see in the credits. And uh, it's, it's just contact. So definitely, yeah, use, make those contacts now. Absolutely. Yeah. And one of them, um, one of the guys who I lived next to freshman year, he just composed something for one of his finals for class last quarter. And now he wants to do a music video for it. And so he's like, can you produce this for me? And I'm like, for all of the work you've done for me, absolutely. I can produce that for you. And so it's a, it's a give and take kind of thing. That's cool. And, and then you, now you have music video. Exactly. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Great questions. I'm excited that so many people are asking questions. So I don't know why I did that. Uh, to kind of go back to our fake example here, we are at, what did I say, $6,500 for our total budget. Present it to the director. The director freaks out because they just don't have that kind of money. So they ask us to cut the budget. So there are always areas in the budget that you can cut. And kind of like Martha and I have been talking about, just the more things you cut, you're your scale starts to go down. You start to go down on the sliding scale. But if you have to cut the budget, there are things you can cut. So I would always start in expendables because it's quite literally in their name. They are expendable things, things that you don't have to pay for. Um, so cut down on expendables, cut down on that extra food money, cut down on that extra parking money, decrease your locations budget and decrease your arts budget. Kind of just doing all of that right off the bat, you should be able to shave quite a few hundred dollars off your budget, if not a couple thousand. So just for fun, I'll kind of go in here and change all of the expendables to 50 instead of 100, and then decrease those categories that I just talked about. So now our production budget was at 5,500 and now it's at 4,000. And so just by cutting a couple expendable budgets, um, we didn't even get rid of anything. We just cut things. So all of the expendables were moved down to 50 instead of 100. I cut the craft services and the extra meals budget. I cut the you know safety net parking budget the locations budget from 1000 to 750 all the expendables to 50 and the arts budget from 1000 to 750 and we saved $1500 so you can kind of keep bringing it down you can cut expendables completely you can cut locations completely if you know you're shooting at your friend's house um you can keep bringing it down to whatever the financer is comfortable with or has the money for and i just will <clears throat> say that you can also go through your script. Um, I mean, one thing is there's sometimes in a script, there's going to be a certain things that just make things more expensive, like right, multiple locations or like a big art piece that it sounds like in your film completely needed, like yeah. it's centered, everything was kind of centered on that. But perhaps another film, it's kind of like, oh, it's in the background, but it doesn't really, really matter. So it is kind of like, does it matter? or does it not? Um, one example I, I like to use in class, there was this film and this woman is going out on multiple dates and it was like a montage of her going on bad dates. And it was like different restaurant, different guy, different restaurant, different guy. And it was just really, really, everything was getting so expensive. And the line producer looked through it and said, can we, how about if she's going on multiple dates with multiple guys, but it's at the same place? Right. So we could just shoot this back to back. There, she's just changing her outfit, bringing a different actor. They sit down. We shoot for a second. Rearrange the food. Different, like, and you then for we, one location, you're there the whole day. Right. Right. It's so much less time. It's one location, and it's funnier. Like, not only does it accomplish, um, like, it's it's the, the goal of bringing down the budget, but it also accomplishes 
like the meaning of that montage and makes it even funnier. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it is like if you are thrifty with an with an eye to it, like what's important in the script and what's not, you can really make the important stuff pop and maybe get rid of the stuff you don't need. No, exactly. Yeah. So I feel like there are a lot of things in the script, in the shot list, even sometimes. Um, I know Sam, not to call you out, but Sam is directing something this coming June. And we were looking at his budget with his producer the other day. And it was like, what, there was like one location. And it was like, there were three shots there. And I was just kind of like, are those three shots worth $500? The answer can be yes. But you need to know that. Right. I think in that, if I recall, in that case, it was yes, because the shot was uh, a close up or it was very pertinent to the story. So in, in that case, it ended up being a yes. But uh, yeah. it is a discussion that needs to be had because it is a short, uh, it's a short scene. We actually ended up rewriting it, but that's not the point. The point mm -hmm. being, you, it's, it's up to the director and the producer to come up with something together to make sure that the story is told, but you're still working with the budget. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like the, the important takeaway there is like the answer is allowed to be yes. Like the answer is allowed to be that shot is worth $500. You just need to know that going into it. Perfect. So just to kind of emphasize what uh, Martha and I were just talking about, I have some budget examples from three short films that I have produced in the past. So to just kind of go over some bullet points, I tried to pick three short films that were almost identical. Um, so they're all two day shoots. They were all 20 person crews. They were all two person cast. One of them had a minor, one of them was SAG, and one of them we had a stunt coordinator for, but they were all one location. Two of them didn't want a post or a festival budget and one did and had like a couple other things. Um, but just to kind of show that sliding scale of like these, they're all pretty much the same shoot, but their budgets are astronomically different. So this is the first one. So this one has a couple extra things. They wanted to get an LLC because they wanted to distribute their film. Um, they rented some equipment and they wanted a full festival and post budget. So their total ended up being, you know, about 4,500 for production and overall almost 7,000. But, you know, again, kind of keeping in mind, it's like, it was a two day shoot. It was a 20 person crew, it was one location and it was two cast members. And so we're already at $7,000 for this one. If you go to kind of this medium scale budget, the only difference that, the only really big difference is they didn't have a post or festival budget. Um, but now we are down to, you know, under $1,500 for again, two day shoot, 20 person cast, one location, very, very tiny now compared to $7,000. And then if you go even lower than that, this is literally just food, art, some extra cash. And same thing, two day shoot, 20 person crew, two person cast, one location, $750. That was my emphasis on, there is a very big sliding scale. <laughs> So the last thing I kind of wanted to talk about in terms of budgeting is expenses um, because, you know, everyone spends so much time in their budget and so much time in the number at the bottom of that budget of what they're going to be spending. And then people just kind of go and spend money. They don't really track what, what they're spending. So this is how I have been taught to set up expenses. It's kind of complicated. There's many, many different ways to do it. But so I have an example from a receipt here and this is like a, is an actual receipt that I have received on set. So this was a production target pickup with just a bunch of uh, office supplies basically. But so when I'm inputting a receipt, there's two things that I look for. I look for the date. Um, not that anyone has ever, but I'm sure it has happened and will happen. Um, but you just want to make sure that the date actually lines up with like the date when you're 
filming, buying, purchasing. Um, it's never happened to me, but I have had it happen to a couple friends where like someone will bring in a receipt from 2016 and be like, can I get reimbursed for 70 bucks? And you're like, yeah, sure. Of course it's stationary. Like obviously. Um, so I just check the date and then the total at the bottom. Um, honestly, like I do glance over what people purchase, but if you hire the right people, you hire a good AD, you hire a good PD, like you kind of trust them to buy what you actually need and not overspend. So we know that this was bought on March 1st and the total is $60 and nine cents. I'm trying to escape from, there we go. <laughs> so in my budget at the bottom here, I also have an expenses tab, which looks almost identical to the budget. It just has a bunch more columns. So I input everything that's in the budget. Um, and if there's any money that I know I'll kind of automatically spend, like I know the U-Haul is going to be about $120. I know the mileage for the U-Haul is going to be about $150. I'll put that in. So this is a little confusing. There's lots of columns. You don't have to understand them all, but it's basically the vendor is where it was bought from. So it was bought from Target. The card is whose card it's on because sometimes it's on my card. Sometimes it's on the director's card. Sometimes it is the first AD's card. Sometimes there's a parent card we're using. But so I like to know if for whatever reason we have to dispute a charge, it's like whose actual, you know, debit credit, whatever card was it on. So let's say it was on mine. And the person who bought it was the first AD. It was $60.09. The receipt we did get, sometimes you don't get the receipt, but you do need to know that you spent that money. And then I have this thing called the receipt number. So when you do either a big short or a big movie, a thesis film, whatever, you will end up with a lot of receipts, like a lot. <laughs> so I've adopted this system called the number letter system. So every department has a number. So production would be one. And then every receipt has a letter. So this is the first receipt going into production. So that receipt is 1A. And then you throw them all in a Google Drive and you forget about it. But the easy thing is, if you number it like this, when you go into Google Drive, you can be like, okay, something happened with that target receipt. I'm going to go into my Google Drive, search 1A, and that receipt is going to pop up. And so it's just an easier way of filing you don't have to do it. It gets a little hard, especially um, that movie I did with James Choi. We were in like 1AB, 1XZ. Like you, you got to start, you know, pumping out the letters, but it does make it a little easier. So I think for the most part, you answered the next question we have here, which is, do you have an organizational system for uh, keeping track of your receipts? Um, I think the only other part of that question that wasn't answered was uh, they said, how do you keep track of your receipts on set? So I guess what they mean is anytime mm. somebody goes out to buy something, do you take those receipts from them or do you rely on them to send them back to you? So I always have a, um, like a receipt folder on set that people can just throw things into so they don't lose them. But I also really encourage people to take pictures of every receipt that they have as soon as it's printed from the register. Um, and just text me the picture, or email me the picture. Um, and after the fact to like uh, a couple days after we wrap on set, I'll send out an email and I'll be like, Hey, everyone receipts are due seven days from today. I usually try and make it a week after we wrap. Um, and that's kind of just like my, my cutoff of like, if you want a gas reimbursement or you want a grocery run reimbursement, like it needs to get to me within these seven days, because after the fact, like, you know, don't come to me six months down the line and be like, you owe me $40. Like that's not going to work. So I'm pretty flexible with receipts as long as you get it to me in some fashion. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Martha, anything to add? No, no. I was just going to say, yeah, taking a picture of it is, is a very good tip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I've, uh, I've lost too many receipts. So just oh. take a picture of it as soon as you get it. Yeah, for sure. As soon as I always get a receipt, I would turn it in as, as soon as possible. Yeah. Because, absolutely. But taking a picture is beautiful. Yeah. Cool. So the second part of our presentation is funding, which ironically is, you know, it's going to go pretty fast. So for funding, I'd say the biggest and easiest way for especially students to get funding is through grants or festivals. 
So at DePaul, we have two main grants um, at the film school. We have the undergraduate production grant, which I've entered and gotten quite a few times. And we also have the graduate thesis grant. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, I think they are both for $5,000. But obviously, if you're an undergraduate, you can apply for the undergrad grant. And if you're a graduate, you can only apply for the graduate grant. Um, I, I think the majority of things that get made at DePaul are made through one of these grants. They are, the committees are very nice people. They are very helpful. They will help you with your script, your funding, your package, the whole thing. Um, this is like my recommendation as just another student of like, if you want to make a film at DePaul and you don't have the money, this is where you should go. Um, I think they both run once a year. Usually the applications are due in December and then they do a pitch in February and you find out in March. So the intention is to kind of shoot it spring quarter and then the next year you would like put it through post and everything. There are also smaller club grants. I know DKA either has a grant or is working on getting a grant. Um, inclusion in the industry has a grant. I think Film Fatels has a grant. Um, the DCC is attempting to work out like a grant, but there are film clubs that give a couple hundred to like a thousand dollars. And so if you're a little short or you have a smaller film that you're doing, that's really great too. Um, there are outside of DePaul grants. Uh, just to be transparent and honest, I haven't heard of any that go very well. Um, I haven't heard of anybody who's gotten a grant outside of DePaul. What I have heard of people getting outside of DePaul is entering and winning a festival. And so this isn't necessarily a short film festival, but this is a screenwriting festival or um, a proof of concept festival. So you made like a minute film and you got money for your 30 minute film, or you made a 10 minute short and you got money for your feature film. Um, that happens a lot. So like enter, enter festivals with your, with your screenplays, enter festivals with your really short shorts or your proof of concepts, and you will most likely get money for those bigger things if you do well. Yeah, anytime you can get money from grants um, or, or winning something, absolutely. Like, don't, don't shy away from that. Like, it, go for as many grants as possible because uh, you will not have to, you know, pay the money back. And uh, it, it's just, it is a very smart way to do it. It's just, it does take time and research to, to find out about them. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'd say like the DePaul ones are great because they're in-house. The committees generally know the people who are applying. Like it feels very much like you're just kind of partnering with the school to make your film happen rather than like actually applying and like winning. Yeah, I think that's exactly what Paul's going for. It's a it's a partnership, and they're they're wanting they they want to help as many students as possible to to do this. Yeah. So grants are my preferred way. Um, crowdfunding works a little asterisk. Um, it works most of the time. I have a couple examples here that I'll go through, but just to kind of go through the crowdfunding thing, so. Just right off the bat, don't do Kickstarter. Um, it's very outdated. It's really for like startups or, um, you know, little gadgets that people create. Like it is not made for film. It is not made for art. Um, and the Kickstarter is a platform I just don't really like. I don't really agree with. Um, if you raise money and you don't hit your goal, um, they might have updated it, but last time I checked, Kickstarter gets to just keep the money that you raised. Whereas like most crowdfunding web websites, if you don't raise all of, their, all of your money, it gets, you know, redistributed to whoever gave it. It just gets reimbursed. Um, but Kickstarter keeps the money if you don't raise all of it. So it's like those people still gave $100, $200, but it's no longer going to you. So I just say I don't like Kickstarter at all. Um, after Kickstarter, Indiegogo became pretty popular, and that is a platform that I used with um, one of my directors for Gaby. For Indiegogo, I do really like it because if you don't hit your goal, it doesn't matter. Anything that you raise, even if it's 1% of your goal, you get to keep it. Um, for the film that we did, Gaby, I'll just show you our platform real quick. 
it's very cute. It's a very nice platform. It gets to, you know, you get to see how much you raised. You get to do a video. You get to put comments up. Um, Indiegogo works on a perk system. So it's like every tier you get new stuff. Um, and this was a really great campaign. We had a graphic designer who made all of these little breakdown bubbles for us. It went really well. Um, but as you'll see, we only raised 77% of our funds, which, you know, is totally fine. It happens. Seed and Spark is like, I'd say the new hot thing. Um, Seed and Spark is made specifically for short films and they work on a green light system. So you need to raise at least 80% of your fundraising goal to be greenlit. And then you get to keep whatever money you make after that. So you need to raise at least 80% and then anything beyond that you get to keep. Um, this is the biggest success story, I've, success story I've heard at DePaul. It's Airbed by Matt Calera. It was his uh, directorial debut, very personal, beautiful story. Um, but he had honestly absolutely no issues raising the money. Everyone was super excited um, and supportive of it, which was great. But I think the key here is he was raising this for post-production, not production. And so he did not need as much money um, as he probably would have needed for production. But so I guess kind of a tip there is like you can raise money for specific sections of production. You don't just have to do it for the whole thing. You can be like, I have enough money to get the movie made but then I'm going to need some money for festivals or whatever. The biggest thing that I see working right now as a, you know, a up and coming producer and just like, a, I'm a zillennial technically the whole, the whole generation thing really gets me. But the biggest thing that I see working right now is social media marketing. And so this is a short film that is now becoming a feature called Egghead and Twinkie. Um, me and a few friends found the director on TikTok. Her name is Sarah. Um, and I can't find a picture of her, but she made a proof of concept while she was getting her MFA at Florida State, entered it into a film festival. She got $36,000 of funding to, um, do this feature, but because of the pandemic, all of that funding kind of dispersed. And so now she kind of, she made this TikTok of basically like, hey, this really cool thing happened to me and it fell through. Can anyone help? And they are not on any crowdfunding websites. They are raising money solely through TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, just by getting those likes, shares, to? post, whatever. And it seems to be going really, really well for them. We talked to Sarah a couple of weeks ago and she was like, yeah, we've almost hit our goal purely just because we went viral on TikTok. And so you don't even have to go to these crowdfunding websites. You just kind of have to, Martha and I were talking about this earlier. You just have to make people care. That's really the key. Yeah, I like all the examples that you're giving, like the time and effort to like make them look nice and the information is all there and there might be a video. It's not just like, it's this film, give me some money. Yeah. It, it's a lot of time and information and you're pitching it to to everyone so you're you're doing a really good presentation um so they are interested and excited about this project and want to see this actually happen absolutely yeah yeah um and then just kind of other funding just to quickly note on it there are other ways to get money um I know Sam got uh, an investor and partnered with a nonprofit um, to kind of help fundraise for them. Sam, do you want to give a little elevator pitch? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm working with a uh, production company that's also a nonprofit out in Los Angeles called From the Heart Productions. They are what they call themselves a fiscal sponsorship. So the way it works is you set up your film as an LLC, which most most professionals do anyway, so they can have a bank account for the film. And then you are able to finance under their 501c3, which means that any investors you get for the project are then able to get a tax cut or tax break on the money that they invest into the film because it's considered a charitable donation, which uh, especially for short films I find to be super helpful because quite frankly, most short films, if not all short films, the investors aren't going to get their money back. So it's very, very helpful to say, hey, we're not even if we're not friends and family to you, here is a reason you can invest in this that will ultimately help you financially because you're going to get a tax break at the end of it. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. It's basically like, you know, I'm not great at taxes, but it's kind of like free money. It's like, if you give me this money now, you'll just get it back on your taxes at the end of the year. So exactly. Yeah. Um, and I know Martha and I were talking about the other day, just this idea of working with brands or local businesses. If your film is, you know, a running film and you know, sneakers are going to be super prevalent, maybe partner with like a local sneaker maker. I don't know if that's a thing or like a local athletic shop. Um, you know, I know a bunch of Etsy stores are big and opening up right now. It's like partner with like these local people, basically make it an ad for them. Yeah, absolutely. I know my, um, my producer is doing that with where he works. Um, we're going to be able to advertise them uh, in the film, in the credits. And then also, I believe, fingers crossed, they're going to be able to supply Crafty for us for free. Um, and I know that they'll be able to actually get a tax break on that because From the Heart takes uh, exactly. material donations. Yeah. And even if you're not able to get like financial sponsorships from brands, you can always ask for stuff. And food is honestly one of the things that has worked for me time and time again. If you go to a local business and you're like, we will put your name in the credits, put your logo on social media, put your logo in the film, we'll shoot at your restaurant. Like we're not asking for anything other than for you to feed us for a day. And it's kind of this like mutual deal of like, we will give you free advertising if you feed us. Yeah, that's that's such a great point. There's so many times where it's like perhaps people or or right shops or, or restaurants, maybe they're not going to give you money, but they can give you something else. They can give you and even post houses, they can give you time in the edit suite or and, and you know, sometime in the middle of the night you can get in there. So you <clears throat> you can't always rely on people to give you perhaps cash, but they can give you in in kind things like right exactly. like food or props or, or or time yeah so kind of closing thoughts uh I feel like we touched on this earlier but at the very bare minimum if you cannot afford a location if you cannot afford props costumes set deck anything just feed people um people are taking time and effort out of their day and so like if all you can afford is like 150 bucks for the weekend just for like pizza and some snacks people will be very very grateful um and then kind of a note I had on here I learned this from Tim Pertinell who is uh the head of the creative producing, producing department um basically just anytime you're asking people for money or support or anything don't burn any bridges or exhaust your network the first time around there will always be another film to make um you know, don't go to your parents every single time and ask for money or don't go to the same relative every single time to ask if you can use their restaurant, like spread the wealth a little bit. You know, one of the things that I wrote down that I just wanted to, you mentioned um, the Chicago Film Office, mm -hmm. just wanted to go in, in closing thoughts. Um, yeah, use all the DePaul resources you can, um, obviously, the, the equipment, the people, um, any resources there. But also, the Chicago Film Office is such a great resource, and they are so helpful. Yeah. The, the first time I moved to Chicago, I had to shoot uh, in Millennium Park, and I was like, uh, and I just called, I left a message, and the director of the Chicago Film Office, like, called me back, and walk me through the permits I needed or didn't need and just like it was a it was a lovely introduction to Chicago um but they are very they're they want things to shoot here they want people to be making films they want to help students so if you call them if you ask them questions they will be very very happy to work with you absolutely and I one professor at some point in time told me like keep playing the student card as long as you can the Chicago film office loves students the SAG office loves students like ask questions you know if you're on your first set with a SAG actor like email call the office they will help you walk you through it they will not be upset with you if you do things wrong like you know, if you're talking to a location, tell them it's your first time producing something and that you're a student and you're not super sure how to do this. Like people want to help students, especially while we're learning. So use that card, like use that empathy that you're getting. Absolutely. Yes, use, use it while you can. <laughs> yeah, while you can, yeah. <laughs> For sure.
I know we're a little bit behind uh, the live stream because we're in real time and it's a couple seconds behind us. So I'm gonna leave it open for a couple of minutes to see if any other questions come in. Uh, I'll just say that I learned a ton. I uh, one thing that I hadn't heard from you, Leah, was about the cra uh, the crafty equation and the contingency equation. Yeah. Um, really easy and simplistic math that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, and then overnight crafty has me excited because I'll be working a couple of overnights on a professional shoot pretty soon, and I'm like, yeah, probably gonna be pretty good. Overnight too. crafty, like overnights are not fun, but overnight crafty, it's a good time. Tends to be pretty good, which uh just a production secret that like no one really talks about but it's like if you have a bad day like plan a good meal people will really be grateful absolutely any other closing thoughts from either you or martha before we uh sign off for the night no i think so i feel like that was a lot of information a lot of information <laughs> was information dump yeah absolutely yeah. but very very useful uh very practical advice oh, definitely right, well, thank you martha for being here and sharing your thoughts and stories my pleasure. All right. Well, thank you both for joining us. Keep your eyes on the social media pages for our next uh, presenters. Uh, it's going to be Marlo Verina and Jess King presenting on the concept to creation here at DePaul University. So we'll see you guys then. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. All right. So.